Okay, hi. Um, so today I'm going to speak about uh, Transmango, uh, which is a project I'm currently working on, um, and a particular method that we've used. Um, but first I'm going to provide some context. Um, so the food system is very complicated, obviously. Um, we have lots of external factors here. So this, this diagram is just a, a very brief illustration of this, the complicated nature of the system. So external factors at the top, many, many internal factors from um, human-made issues, natural issues, um, supply with production and demand and consumption, there's distribution losses. So there's an awful lot going on in the food system. But ultimately, the ideal outcome of the food system is uh, food security or food and nutrition security. So here we have a definition of it. Um, and there's three things that I'd like to really uh, focus on in this definition. So food security exists when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. So the three things are at the issue of access. Um, so there is enough food in the world for everyone. You know, there, you know, there's plenty of food out there. It's just not being distributed to everyone. So access is an important issue. And the second thing is nutritious. It's not just about feeding people. It's about nourishing people as well. So the food has to be of a particular quality. It's not just enough that people have X amount of calories. And the third is the issue of preferences. So it's, again, it's, an, it's, it's more than just nourishing people. It's about the social and cultural issues around food as well. And uh, Healthy Food for All, an organisation um, that have folded now, that we're based in Dublin, had some really nice indicators of food poverty, poverty that they had developed. And a couple of these indicators of food poverty related to, you know, not being able to afford um, a, a roast dinner once a week or a vegetarian equivalent or not being able to maybe have friends for dinner every, every so often. So these are some um, important nuances to the definition of food uh, security. So this is what Transmango is interested in, food security, or rather food and nutrition security. So we really want to foreground this nutrition issue. But currently, as this complicated food system works, we don't have food and nutrition security. <clears throat> Within the EU, 11% of people are currently living in food and nutrition insecurity. You can see this. Um, this was um, at a low point in 2009 at just under, I think it was just under 10%, and it began to rise again from then onwards. And connected to this food insecurity are issues such as um, obesity. So over 50% of people in the EU are either overweight or obese, and one in three 11-year-olds are in the EU are, are overweight or obese. And these people suffer from the, the related um, health complica complications. And I'm not saying that food and nutrition insecurity is the only cause of this, but that it's certainly a contributory factor. Now, paradoxically, when you have so many people being malnourished and um, hungry, you have other problems in the food system, such as uh, food waste. So 88 million tonnes of food are wasted annually in the EU, with associated monetary costs of 143 billion euro. So this is evidence of the fact that the food system is not working. It's not working to feed people. It's not working for the environmental and the economic impacts of food waste. It's not working for people's health. And there's other, other issues such as land degradation, water pollution, natural resource depletion, poor labour conditions, and difficulty for producers mainly to maintain their livelihoods. So not only are there current problems in the food system, but there's also evidence that food systems are vulnerable to future political, technical and environmental changes and shocks. And this is going to um, endanger food and nutrition security even further. And examples of this are like what our previous speaker Wayne has just talked about in his scenarios of these extreme weather events or um, political vulnerabilities would be Brexit would be a great example of that. So the causes of the current food system problem are obviously complex, as I've said, but it's clear that policy plays a role. Um, and there are examples from the EU of the ineffectiveness of or the unintended consequences arising from existing policies. So the reason I'm focusing on EU policy here rather than Northern Irish policy is because the project Transmango 
doesn't have a partner that's based in Northern Ireland. So we don't have specific data on Northern Irish policies and synergies or deficiencies in policies here. We have 11 partners. So I'll talk about the project a little bit more in detail in a couple of minutes. But just to, to give you some a uh, bit of an overview, we have 11 partners, one in Tanzania and 10 across the EU in eight different countries. We do have UK partners in the University of Oxford and Cardiff University, but they would have done their case study research in Cardiff. Um, and in um, Ireland, we did our case study research down in Cork. So that's why we're focusing on EU policies. So we have partners in the University of Wageningen who did this assessment with European level stakeholders on um, EU policy. They weren't just looking at the negative things, they were looking for possible synergies and positive elements in EU policies as they relate to the food system. Um, but while a lot of what they found were these ineffectiveness or unintended consequences um, with these incoherences and, and deficiencies. So just to go through a couple of these, uh, the second one, so you might have increases in food taxation affecting the ability of the poor to access to healthy food. So this is of course going to contribute to the lack of affordability and access to sufficiently nutritious food. So one policy is giving with one hand and the other policy is taking with the other. Uh, down to the fourth point there, uh, food advertising regulated only by voluntary codes allowing for the marketing of unhealthy foods to continue. So this is contributing to the obesogenic food environment that we now see. The next one, non-flexible food safety and quality standards. So for example, you might have food which can't be sold because there's maybe an issue with the, the language that's on the, the food. Um, it means that it can't be sold, but there's nothing wrong with the actual food. So these kind of issues, it's just an example of something that might lead to um, contributing to food waste. So as I said, we don't have any Northern Irish partners, but just having a quick look around at the information on Northern Ireland and, and how this is relevant. So there does seem to be some promising initiatives here focusing on food poverty and some strategies for tackling obesity. But similar to other European jurisdictions, there's definitely a lack of an integrated food policy here. Now, it could be argued that this deficiency has contributed to poor food and nutrition outcomes in the region. So as uh, research from 2009-2010 found that 23% of all people in Northern Ireland are living in food poverty. And 28% um, of children are living in food poverty. Whenever you find food poverty statistics, children always have a slightly higher um, percentage as a vulnerable group. 5% of the population suffer from malnourishment, and this number is higher for some vulnerable groups, such as those, those who are over 65. And almost two-thirds of adults in Northern Ireland are either overweight or obese. So 37% are overweight, and on top of that, 25% are obese. So this topic has garnered some attention from leadership, with the former Health Minister Simon Hamilton speaking in 2015 on the vulnerability of low-income individuals to food poverty and its attendant health issues, as well as the complicated nature of food poverty and how those in power can work to address these problems. To quote him, he said, My ministerial colleagues also have a contribution to make to help address food poverty. For example, adequate housing, transport, roads, community infrastructure, local community, etc. So I think with that, it just shows you that the, the food issue is wider than just food. It's about whether or not permission was given for a Tesco to be built on the edge of town. How did that affect shops in town? Did they close down? Do then people have to drive to the Tesco? Do they have cars? Are they disabled? Are there bus routes? So things like this. It's really complicated, you know, the creation of food deserts and food swamps. And a number of issues which have been identified as hot topics for assembly business, the 2016-2017 list, are most certainly connected to food and nutrition insecurity. So just to give you a flavour of this, within the public finance heading, the impact of budget cuts on well-being is relevant, the effectiveness of social and community clauses for public procurement, under governance, public sector reforms, so models which promote sustainability, health, social care and the environment. Um, under agriculture, sustainability of farm incomes. Under the environment, pollution, climate change and waste management. Under social development, welfare reform. I know in, the, in Britain, welfare reform has very much affected the number of people in food poverty. Um, and health, with health inequalities, mental health, obesity. All of this is connected to food and nutrition insecurity and food poverty. 
So to get into Transmango, Transmango is a study which aims to investigate the current problems of the European food system, but it also wants to focus at where there may be vulnerabilities for the future, and conversely where future improvements might be made. So it's interested in potential problems, but also potential um, adaptive capacities for the food system. Transmango understands that the food system is, or that food is produced and consumed in a complicated system, and as a result, it considers the problems of the food system from a range of perspectives. So, as I said, we have 11 partners, 11 different institutes across nine different countries. So, we're coming at this from a very much an international or a multinational perspective, and it's also very much an um, interdisciplinary study. We have um, mathematicians, we have climate modellers, we have dietitians, geographers, economists, uh, sociologists. So that gives us the capability of really viewing this problem in a systemic way. Now, so not only is Transmango international and multidisciplinary, um, it also uses a range of methodological approaches. We've used Delphi analysis, we have had um, EU workshops with stakeholders at an EU level. Um, we have done climate modelling, but there is one methodology that I'd like to focus on today, and that's the, uh, a methodology that was used within our case studies. So within the European context, we had, as I said, eight different countries, which you can see on the map, and each country had two case studies, a satellite and a more main case study. How each um, country approach these case studies was different. We were open, we were free to choose what uh, methods we used, but there was one method we all were required to use, and that was our scenarios guided transition pathways method. So we used, we had workshops, each country had these workshops. And I should say that in, um, in Ireland, the workshops that, or the, the case studies that we did, our satellite case study was on Be A Food Initiative, which has since been rebranded as Food Cloud Hubs, which is a surplus food redistribution organization. And our main case study was Cork Food Policy Council. So they were the organisation that we had um, used, uh, that we did our workshops with. The case studies were chosen because uh, they were considered to be shining lights or bright spots. They were um, organisations that were on the ground and doing really good things. And the idea is that we wanted to be able to see how we could work up what they're doing. Is there any way to kind of expand it? So to explain this methodology, and again, our previous speaker has, has gone into this a bit, but to talk about exactly and specifically how we did it in our workshops, these were conducted a year ago. We had two workshops. Um, the stakeholders involved were people from Cork Food Policy Council plus other relevant stakeholders to Cork's food system. The first step was to visualise the ideal future. So workshop participants brainstormed what the key elements of an ideal future food system was look like. This is based, or this idea of um, visualising is based on, um, or supported by Donella Meadows' uh, quote from her 1994 work. If we don't know where we want to go, it makes little difference that we make great progress. So the idea is that we, if we want to plan well, we need to be very clear about what our goals are. So to do this, we asked all the participants to take a big pile of yellow post-its and a pen and to write down different elements of this idealized food future. So one idea per post-it. And then we grouped all of these together thematically. We organized them on these large pieces of paper. And when we kind of, we, when we had a, a, top, a title for each thematic group, we, we wrote that on a pink post-it. So you can see that there. And then we circled around each group so that they had their own space on the, on the pieces of paper. Then we gave each participant 10 sticker dots and we asked them to put stickers on the topics that they thought were most important. They could put 10 on one if they thought, they could only use five if they wanted, they could spread them out any way they wanted. So the result was that we had about 10 different topics and we wanted to isolate the top three, the three which these people, these stakeholders had, had said were the most important. So the top one, by, by quite a distance, was integrated food policy. The second was systemic food and nutrition, education and culture. And the third was diversified food production systems. So those are the three um, areas that we decided to take forward for planning. So the second step then was to develop step-by-step -step plans to achieve these three sub-objectives using backcasting. 
Now, backcasting involves working backwards from a desirable future vision rather than forwards from the present, and that's forecasting. So we're all used to forecasting as a concept, but we're less used to backcasting. But that's not to say that we don't all do backcasting. We do it every day. So for example, when you're trying to get to work on time, maybe you need to be there at eight o'clock, you decide you want to get the bus at quarter to eight and you leave your house to walk to the bus stop at half seven. This is an example of a type of backcasting. And the idea is that you move backwards in your planning from this goal, and that when you reach a stumbling block, you say, well, we can always get around that, that there's always a way just by adding in other steps and extra steps. And then you continue backwards in your planning until you reach the present. So this is illustrated in, again, what we did in our first workshop. We laid our vision goal out at the end on the right-hand side. And then this is present here. You see on the right-hand uh, picture, this is the present. And our, our future goal was the medium term. I think we were going on 2030 as when we want to achieve this goal. So we started at our at our future goal and worked backwards with our post-its and writing out the, the plans and the elements of our plan. And I should say just the one on the right was the group I was working with. I was focusing on integrated food policy and ironically our group decided to separate it out into three strands of environmental, social and economic um, issues. So this was then taken away and, and typed up and made to a bit more digestible. So this is just a snapshot of again, the group that I was working on, and, and please don't worry if you can't read it because obviously it's tiny, but I'm just gonna talk you through a little bit of it. So we have our three sub-objectives that my group happened to want to divide the goal into. So the first one is environmental, second is social, third is economic. And then we fleshed out these sub-objectives in the next row, that's our end. And then the row below that is step six. So there was step five, four, three, two, and one but I'm not going to go into those today because we don't have the time or, or the space to do that. But just to go through it a little bit, the, the middle one, integrate, our sub-objective was an integrated social policy to be achieved, which strives for a healthy populace and supports social justice in the food system. And to give you a flavour of what the steps in the plan look like, step six, national ministerial briefs are reshuffled to create a holistic department of food, health and the environment. This department is responsible for a number of in initiatives, including, and they're listed there. So that seems, I, th I think that seems quite a distance from where we are today, but this is our goal just before 2030. And there are five more steps before that, which made this, um, this part of the plan possible in theory. So the next step and the, the final one I'm gonna speak about today is the testing of this backcasted plan in the context of different possible future scenarios. So we all have assumptions about the future, which we may not be aware of. When we make plans, we make them with these assumptions in mind. However, circumstances change and scenarios are used in research to help us overcome our own assumptions when planning. Scenarios are these what if stories and they're told in words and images. And they're used to explore these uncertainties of the future. So this image here is from one of the scenarios we used. This, now I should say the scenarios were developed by our partners at EU level. And then we downscaled them, as Wayne said that he did in his workshop, we downscaled them so that they were relevant to the Irish context. In the first workshop, we asked the participants, if this, was, if this is what's happening in Europe, what would it look like in, in the Irish context? And in our first workshop, we, we developed that idea. And then afterwards, we went off and developed the narratives around the Irish um, scenarios. And in the policy brief, I've given us a, a very brief summary of one of the scenario narratives. We had three scenarios that we used. So we're testing the plans in the concept of these different scenarios. So this um, diagram explains how it is. So future vision, element one, plan. So that would be, for example, an integrated food policy. We made the plan, we backcasted it, and then we tested it in the context of the first scenario. So we said, if we wanted to make our plan work in this scenario, would it work? What would we need to change? What tweaks do we need to make? Then we looked at our second scenario and we said the same thing. What changes do we need to make? And then the third scenario. And then we went back and we embedded all of those changes into our plan to create this more robust plan. So this is basically a planning tool, a planning exercise. And I know scenarios can seem a little bit complicated, but ultimately what they are is a stimulus. They're a way to stimulate thinking and to develop robust plans. Um, and again, an illustration of, of this process. So for my group, again, I had 
I, I did three columns, A, B and C. So these were our environmental, social and economic strands. And I had our six steps listed out. And we went through each step and we, for each, each of the three strands and said, what do we need to change? What do we need to add in? And we put our post-its in there. And you'll see there's some gaps there, but that's because some things in our plans worked in these scenarios. Plenty of things worked. So I went off and I embedded this into a document. And the three different colours relate to the three different scenarios. And you'll see in the column on the right, the one that relates to economics, this is step five. Um, for two of the scenarios, we thought that this, this element of the plan would work. So we said it would be achieved in this scenario. We didn't need to make any changes. But for one of the, the scenarios, we did think some changes were made. So we went off and uh, Im embedded all of this information and, and developed it all and came up with basically... Um, what I call a portfolio of options. So it's important to say that these case studies and the scenarios workshops for Transmango were not just about um, gathering data or, or creating data for our study. It was also, uh, we really didn't want to be extractive of these organisations. We wanted to ha help them and you let them have this as a planning exercise so that they could have this nice output. So when I embedded all of this and, and made it look all um, legible, let's say, it was a portfolio of options with many objectives and sub-objectives and sub-sub-objectives for the council to, in an ideal world, go off and, and pick and choose from what they wanted to um, enact. So the results then from all eight case studies, so our partners in Wageningen who are leading this uh, methodology, uh, took all of the findings and developed these redesign principles and I think what's an important point here is that they're practice-led redesign principles. So as I said before, we really were interested in seeing how these shining lights of the food system, these bright spot initiatives, what they're doing might be able to be worked upwards and you know, expanded and, and used elsewhere. So the three redesign principles that we've come up with are firstly to ensure, um, so rather reinforcing food entitlements of uh, traditional and newly emerging vulnerable groups. Secondly, reconnecting sustainability and health. And thirdly, relinking food systems that foster urban rural synergies. So the achievement of these goals can and should be supported by appropriate policy actions. So synthesis of policy recommendations from all case studies is currently underway. Um, but those arrived from, derived from the Irish case study are available, and a selection of these has been listed here on the table. So although we have the synthesis done for the, the practice-led redesign, we're not quite there with the, the policy uh, recommendations. So I'll just give you a flavour of uh, the Irish recommendations. So we're working on this framework of re uh, relating to policy de-siloing, so uh, horizontal integration and vertical integration, and also relating to cross-sectoral or, or cross-chain-based operations. So the recommendations in Ireland are that policymakers demonstrate concrete commitment to a diversification of agri-food production, that policymakers introduce educational reforms to greater embed the topics of healthy diets, cooking skills and sustainable food systems into curricula, and that policymakers facilitate alternative means for food to reach consumers by short-circuiting existing conventional food chains for greater economic and environmental sustainability, for example by supporting public procurement. On the um, cross-sectoral side, we uh, argue that policymakers should facilitate the creation of networks to assist in sustainable food system advocacy work, that they should facilitate the development of private procurement policies which emphasise the use of food derived from a more sustainable system, and that they should work to reduce the production of surplus food, as well as facilitating the repurposing of said surplus food, thus reducing food waste. So these are just some of the recommendations, and these are just from the Irish case study. So the, the case study from the Republic of Ireland, and obviously are, are very much relevant in the Northern Irish context as well. So to conclude, the, the, not only the data, but also the research methods, I feel, are... Um, they very much could be deploy, deployed in the Northern Irish context in order to develop context-specific policy recommendations to support food and nutrition security in the region. Thank you.